as we talk about the United States Grand Prix, it wasn't a spectacular race, but there was a lot of interesting battles within the race. And there's also some great storylines. And our buddy Scott, as usual, had the best seat in the house. He was in the Ferrari paddock. And if he is not one of the luckiest people in the world, I don't know who he is. I am so jealous of Scott. As you see, I got my black Monza Ferrari gear on and he has the updated United States Grand Prix Ferrari gear. Yeah, America F1. America F1. It's a golden run. America F1. I mean, to see a Ferrari 1-2 in the United States was something that, nope, we certainly didn't expect. It's been 18 years since the last one. Uh, there was a 1-2 this year in reverse order in Australia where Carlos was first. And, um Charles was second, but uh, this year at the U.S. Grand Prix in, in Austin, uh, Il Predestinato, as the Italian sports commentators call Charles won. Um, it was, uh, you know, really unexpected to me, uh, but thrilling. Uh, essentially, Ferrari was playing a card from Red Bull last year to see their two cars sort of sail off into the sunset into the you know, sunset ahead of the fray like more than one pit stop ahead of the fray and not on tv because there ain't no battle going on for the lead or for second place and you know everyone is now covering you know p3 in the midfield fight and you know ferrari was, was, was just flawless the with the only thing to worry about was uh would the pit stops be okay but you know look ferrari under fred vassour in 2024 when it comes to pit stops and strategy is not the Ferrari of 2022 under Mattia Bonotto, they hired themselves a racer to run the team. And Fred knows how to race. And Fred buckled down in 2023 and made that pit crew practice more than 1,000 pit stops before the season began. And you see it in the pit stops. The pit stops are now either the first or the second fastest in F1, depending on which week you're talking about. Wow. They connect with Red Bull now. When in 2022 they were kind of a joke, and now they're a formidable force. Uh, it was I didn't know that. I didn't know. That. I yeah, mean, I always see him practicing a lot. I didn't know that he's just he's on him, like like Correct. sliced bread, huh? Fred is a racer, um, and it's made a massive difference. Uh, you, you just don't see the tires not being ready. You don't see the pit stops being 10 seconds. You don't see the strategy pratfalls where they don't know what to do. And it's all things that Fred was able to fix right away uh, through hard work and through his own sort of leadership, his own force. And, and the undercut. He, they did the perfect uh, undercut with uh, Sainz. Correct. Verstappen. I must tell you, Carlos did a fabulous job. I mean, front, in, in the sprint race, he passed oh, Carlos. Race, sprint race. Uh, you know, he, 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 you know, they were all, you know, he, he Past Lando, mm. or him into a mistake, which Lando does whenever, unfortunately, frequently when he's under pressure. Um, and he, Carlos could have easily have won the, the GP. It was just a matter that Charles got ahead on the first turn. He took full advantage of the battle between Max and Lando, and you know went around them on the you know on you know on their left. And uh, if it had been Carlos, because uh, they were both driving at extraordinarily similar pace, Carlos would have won. They both were about on the same pace. You know, Charles said an interesting thing in the in the cool down room. He said he knew that <laughs> he knew Max was going to try to dive bomb the first corner. And his plan was Max is going to dive bomb the first corner. He's going to push Lando wide. I'm going to turn in early and then I'm going to pass both of them because I'm I'm going to have more grip because he was saying that the surface had been repaved and there was one part of the surface that you saw quite a few. I think uh, Yuki spun uh, and not this is not where Lewis spun, but Yuki spun and also Zhao spun right there. And they said uh, right there it was really, really slick. Franco spun too once, I believe. On turn. Yeah, a lot of people spun during practice. And other Look. Charles has grown as a racer. You're not seeing the, the, the same you know, frequency of mistakes when everything is on the line anymore. He's definitely grown as a racer as he's matured. 
he has gotten much better in terms of not bottling it, making as many mistakes under pressure as he used to in 2022. Uh, you're, you're definitely seeing a more mature racer. And yes, he definitely was planning that move out. It was definitely, it was well planned and it was well executed. And Max right. had a tendency to dive bomb on overtakes and try and, the thing about Coda, if you've driven Coda, I had five track days on Coda, myself driving sports cars, is yeah, turn one is very wide. Uh, now, the racing line is very narrow in turn one because you funnel all the way to the left. But when you've got Max trying to do an overtake and sort of push Lando off like he was trying to do, you know, you can get around because it's a very wide turn. But I got to tell you, the thing about it for me that was very special <laughs> as you know being with ferrari is we got to my wife and i were taken by ferrari down under the podium to celebrate the one two not with the crowd but with the team they took us under the podium with the team singing the italian national anthem hugging the people high-fiving the people on the team with the team so if you see the videos that we shot on experiences xo you will see us with the team, you'll see us right next to the team members where, you know, Charles is getting patted on that cap and you'll see us brushing off the stoot from the fireworks from people on the team. You'll see people singing the Italian national anthem with us right next to the team, like the woman that runs the garage with the guests and she's putting up her hand and singing. Uh, it was really for a F1 fan, it doesn't really get to be much more of sort of a religious experience. <laughs> That to be with Ferrari celebrating a one-two under the podium. Uh, I don't know that I don't know if we'll ever get that privilege again. Who was, the, who was the guest for Ferrari when you were in the paddock? Who was the speaker? Oh, the speakers were Mark Janay, who's their promotional driver, uh, uh, and uh, Charles, of course, who spoke on race day. Uh, Carlos Sainz, who spoke on Saturday, and Fred Vassor, who spoke on Saturday. I was sort of hoping for Ali Behrman because he's spoken sometimes. But Ali didn't didn't actually uh, speak this weekend in the paddock club, which was disappointing. But I had my own conversation with him in the paddock um, afterward on race day because what was super nice was after the you know the podium ceremony was over, um, I got to keep this pass that they gave my wife and myself, which was shocking they gave it to us, and we got to hang out in the paddock uh, until it closed after race day. And we got to be there for the team celebrations and the team photo where, you know, they have the signs, Carlos P1, mm -hmm. Carlos, yeah. P1 Carlos P2, where Fred is going around spraying the drivers with champagne, Fred, you're not trying to escape. So you're in that. I was not in that. I was right on the side. I took pictures and videos of it, but I'm like, you know, five feet away from the team. and basically with where the media was. It was with oh, where, wow. you know, F, you know, F1 TV is and, yeah. Kim is and all those people. I was with them you know, basically taking pictures of that and getting wet from champagne with the champagne. Yeah. Now, Unbelievable. what, Unbelievable. when we look at this now, Max, there's this controversy going on, right? And Max finished third yep. and Lando ended up finishing fourth because he got a five second penalty. He did. Did you think when you look at this, do you mm -hmm. think he should have got a penalty or yep. not? Okay. There, there it is. <clears throat> right. Mm -hmm. And obviously, Max has all four wheels off, all four wheels. And mm -hmm. obviously, so does Lando, because he basically dive bombed that corner and just pushed him wide. Right. Now, typically, he did the same thing earlier to Lando, but it was the first lap. So they didn't give a penalty. And normally on the first lap, as you can recall back in, I think it was 2000, maybe 15, Lewis did the same thing to Rosberg. And typically, they don't give a penalty on the first lap. but. Mm -hmm. They you got a penalty, a five-second penalty. George got a five-second penalty. And mm -hmm. I guess what they say, and the rule is, and you can see if you're ahead at the apex, and right here you can see that Max That's is ahead. Well, right? Right? That's, and you can see Max. This is Max is ahead of Lando. And then yeah. right here, George oh. and I guess. George is behind. George looks like he's behind. Right? Oh, George got the five-second and Lando got the five second, but here's the rule. The rule states, the document notes, when considering what a significant portion for an overtaking on the outside of a corner among the various factors that will be looked at by the stewards when exercising their discretion, 
The stewards will consider if the overtaking car is ahead of the other car from the apex of the corner. Mm -hmm. The car being overtaken must be capable of making the corner while remaining within the limits of the track. Now, by reading that, yep. Max did not make that corner. Mm -hmm. Okay. He did not make the corner. He had all four wheels off. Your take on it. Yeah. I, I mean, I must say, given where I was, I didn't see it because I was sort of on the main. I was in the stands at the time. Uh, but I know Max was was ahead via the corner or was ahead at the apex, which this shows that's turn 12. You always at turn 12 as a driver, I the five track of Dakota, you always do end up, you always track out, you know, that is you go from the apex all the way then to the right and you want to hit, you want to take as much track as you can to the right to maximize your radius of your turn to carry as much speed as you can. But you want to actually you want to keep your two wheels to the left of your car within the way within within the track limits. So that's a close call. I know a lot of drivers. When I saw it on TV on the little screen, I did say right away. I thought uh, it looked to me like Lando couldn't possibly have overtaken there and would have to give the position back. I know that that was my immediate take, and I think Alex Jocker, somebody on the air that I heard said the same thing, he's going to have to give the position back, but they didn't. I probably, in McLaren's situation, knowing they had a much faster race car, uh, I believe Lando had much newer tires uh, than he, Max did. He had six, six, six or eight laps. And he had a much faster race car. Mm -hmm. uh, I would have probably given the position back and just overtaken Max. He would have overtaken Max. And What's going that, on with this bib? And what, what did you hear in the paddock about this bib that apparently all the other teams have on the outside, all nine other teams have it on the outside and you can't only see. Red Bull have it on the inside. And I guess it's to take advantage of park for May. And they're saying, why else would it be on the inside if they're not taking advantage of it? Yeah, I, it is a suspicious place to put it. Let's put it to you that way. It, I mean, not that you're seeing any great performance from, from the Red Bull car this year, but um, it, it, it's very odd that it would be there, and that's why they, they uh, in the words of Kristen Warner, you know, changed their effing car. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what he likes to say. It, it just seems strange to me that every year with Red Bull, it's something. We got the cost cap. We got Michael Massey. We got this bib. We have the floor. We have the brake uh, issue. It's always something going on. And it doesn't seem like they play fair like everybody else. I mean, people, it's it's F1. We're supposed to develop. We're supposed to explore. We're supposed to kind of find the gray areas of the rules and take advantage of them. But so a team that wasn't Red Bull told me exactly that, that in, in F1, it's your job to take the rules as far as you can without breaking them. But if you're not pushing the boundaries a little bit, you're not, you're not really winning an F1. Uh, you know? Right. Well, what I find strange but, is when Mercedes was doing all this and Mercedes had the DOS and Mercedes had the front wing and Mercedes okay. had the rear wing, they made them take it off instantly. Like they would say, it'd be like, okay, th that's, that's illegal. Take it off. Right. And then Red Bull seems to skirt for quite a while with these illegal parts. And who knows how long this bib, well, Actually, Christian Horner came out and said that the bib's been on there for three years. He said it in an interview. It's been there for three years. So he's like, well, why are they bringing it up now? It's because been some Red Bull engineer, some Red Bull employees went over to McLaren. That's why. What? Wait, wait, yeah, what? what? My understanding from what I heard in the paddock is that they the whistle was blown on them by some ex-Red Bull employees who went over to McLaren. That's what I heard. I don't know if it's true. That's what I heard. So do you think there's sour grapes or do you think that people are so, Christian Horner so toxic that everybody can't wait to spill the beans? What do you think? I would certainly say Christian is a brilliant team principal, but he is a polarizing figure within, within F1. There's no question of that. I mean, you know, look, as a person, 
he's probably accomplished more in success as a team principal than any other one in the paddock because he built a team from absolute nothing. He didn't inherit a team that was a championship team or a great team. So I, you got to give him props for that. But he's definitely, as team principal goes, as polarizing as it gets. I don't think he has a lot of friends in the paddock among the other team principals. Like most of the other ones seem to get along better and don't like him. Um, but they don't seem to like him. I don't know, but I'm not friends with any team principal. But that's what I see as an outsider there, that the other ones seem to be more chummy. Um, you know, Toto and Fred love each other, even if they kill each other on the track. Mm -hmm. I don't see that same warmth. So I think they all get along kind of with Zach, but they all don't seem to like Christian very much. Um, but I don't know, you know, I can't argue with success. Christian, I think, has had more success from where he started than any other TP in the sport. And they do push the rules. Do they break the rules? I don't know if they break the rules or not, but you certainly have to look at their car carefully if you're the FIA because they do tend to push the limits. Um, do they break the rules? I don't know, but they push the limits. What is going on with Lando and this first lap? I don't get it. He actually had a decent start. And how come everybody in the stands, everybody watching on TV, everybody around the world knew Max was going to dive bomb? So why didn't he cover it? I don't I look, I I don't think Lando has the makings of a world champion. I, I don't know what to say. He is fast. I think he's gonna have a career more like like a DC with like David Coulthard kind of driver or Mark Weber. Excellent driver, super fast, good pace, but he seems to lack that last little bit of something. I mean, let me tell you something. If Lewis Hamilton or Max Verstappen or Fernando or I think Charles had the Mercedes, excuse me, had the McLaren car since Miami. I think this driver's championship would have been sewn up a long time ago by any of them. They would have won a lot of races and Lando's won too. And I think, you know, and I think it's because he just, I don't know what it is, but he just makes too many mistakes. I mean, he is fast. Oh, he's three. He's won three, right? Since since Miami, right? Oh, has it been three? Well, yeah, yeah it's Miami. he's won three races this year. Okay, yeah, Miami, Singapore. What was the other one? You're right. He won three. Races. It's been three. Yeah. yeah, but there is something that's missing, and I yeah. don't know what it is. Excellent driver, but it's that last little bit of something that separates the excellent drivers because he's really one of the top drivers in F1 from the from the world champions, and it's that last. It's just not making those mistakes. When Lewis or Max has a top car, they get it done, period. And this might, and from the looks of it and how Ferrari's looking, this might be his chance because next year, I think Ferrari's really going to be in the mix when Lewis gets there and him and Charles are probably going <laughs> to, the uh, fireworks are going to fly next year. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. And as we segue into talking about Mercedes, it, because I can't wait and so can pretty much every lewis fan cannot wait until he's out of this team because he said and i quote i think i should start from the pit lane change the floor give me the old spec i'll start from the pit lane and then we'll see what we can do from there he was already talking about next week he was like well you know i didn't have the greatest of qualifying you know and i don't you know this the the car is just, I don't know what's wrong with this car. It's, it's, it, it's Sybil. It, that's what that car is. It's Sybil. It's, it's here. It's there. It's there. It's here. It's, uh, it's up. It's down. It's left. It's right. I mean, it's never right in that window. When it's in that window, it seems like it's one of the better cars on the grid, but it's very often not in that window. The, well, the Mercedes performance window isn't a window. It's a frigging slit. <laughs> I, I, I mean, yes, yeah. it's in the window. Look, I was at Spa, as you know, and I saw Mercedes cross the grid. And it was exciting because I love Lewis. He's my favorite driver. Right. But the window was a slit. And they don't understand their car. They They've don't. They've never been able to understand the ground effects car. They don't. And, yeah, exactly. And... I got to tell you, there is nobody in F1, there is no team in F1 
that wants to get the hell out of the ground effects era and go to the next set of regulations where it's very powertrain dependent with less aero, because they have the worst aero department in F1, than Mercedes. Hmm. Why would you say they have the worst aero department? They don't have a great aero group. They have a great engine. They've always had the best engine. They've always struggled with aero comparatively. How come they don't go and steal somebody from another team and put them in the aero department? I don't know what it is, but they've never had great aero. They have had the best PU in F1. They have the best power unit in F1. They do. Um, and they're a well-run team. They have decent, good strategy, good drivers. Yeah, they have a very strong team principle. They have a good esprit de corps generally. Team is well-run. But the aero has never been at, at the level of, of, of a Red Bull. Now, or, should it should Toto, the owner, fire Toto, the principal, at this point? No. I, I mean, after eight World Constructors titles, I think you've earned a little bit of goodwill. Or a lot of goodwill. <laughs> no. um, we'll see, though. I, I mean, we'll see how they do in the next era. If they blow another set of regulations, uh, you know, Toto, the owner, may <laughs> have to decide that maybe someone else should get the chance. You know, maybe he... Uh, We'll see. I, I mean, they can't blow in second set of regulations. Like they well, with all the conspiracy theorists out there, they say that they're doing this to Lewis because Lewis had a big lead on George, and they're making sure that by the end of the season, George is ahead of Lewis. That's what they're – and and you know what? <laughs> they might be right <laughs> because it seems like all the conspiracy theories about Mercedes seem to come true. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I just know that if an eight-time – excuse me, seven-time world champion, um, excuse me, uh, tells you, you know, the most successful the most successful driver in F1 history. You know, some say he's the best, some say he's in the top, so, you know, whatever, whether your best driver is Schumacher or, or Max or Senna, whatever. When you have a driver of this stature who's telling you, start me in the pit lane because I can't control my car, Maybe you listen to him when he's qualified at P9, P18, or P19. Maybe you listen to him. What if he has to lose? I don't know what it is about them and not listening to Lewis. I don't know. Time and what time again, like not listening to the guy. I, I, I don't understand. When I don't understand a, it either. When you have a driver with that kind of record, show him a little respect. Obviously, he knows how to win and knows the car and knows what's, what works and what doesn't work. I, I don't get it. And you know what? When you're that bad, you have nothing to lose. And I'll give you a perfect example. I was a guest of Aston Martin last year in Austin. Okay. Their cars were absolute shit during the sprint race, you know, and they broke park. They were like dead last. Mm -hmm. And they broke park Ferme to basically revert the cars back to the way they were before these upgrades, which were a disaster class. They basically you know, put the cars back to the way they were in the earlier part of the season when they were getting podiums all the time, when Fernando had like seven or eight podiums. Okay. And you know what? Fernando and Lance made their way up from the pit lane all the way back into the points. Unfortunately, Fernando had a floor failure, but Lance finished like P8. And you know what? That, that, that's exactly what they should have done with Lewis. If somebody with that kind of record tells you, basically, I can't control the car, maybe you should listen to him. Okay, he did get from P17 to P uh, 12 before he crashed, but you know what? Show, show a seven-time world champion more respect than that, because obviously you, Mercedes, didn't know how to set up the car. Yeah. How many crashes, spins did they have? George binned at full speed and you know, rang his bell in turn 19. Lewis, how many you know spins and you know offs did he have during practices? I mean, it was a joke. Everybody in the paddock was talking about what the hell happened to Mercedes? What is wrong with their car? That's what people in Ferrari were talking about. What's what's going? What's up with Mercedes? I think they're better off not bringing in these upgrades. The, obviously, the upgraded floor does not work. It's the second or third time they've tried to have that spec and to keep reverting back to the old spec. Just leave the old spec in and just be done with the season. Just run that old spec. Don't spend any more money on this year and just run it to the end of the season. You're not going to be first in the constructors. You're not going to be second in the constructors. You're not going to be third in the constructors. You pretty much have fourth place sewn up, and you're not going to move up. You're not moving down. So just run the old spec and leave it at that, 
and let's move on with the season. You know what? The package they had at Spa seemed to work pretty darn well. Uh, maybe they should use that package because that package crushed the grid, and it was a beautiful thing to see. And just leave it at that. Hey, Moving I'm on, talking. what did you – Haas and people, I mean, quietly, another eighth for my guy, Nico Hulkenberg. They had – Doubles scoring in the sprint race. Last race, he had eighth. I mean, they are constantly scoring either eighth, seventh, or I'd say not they, but Nico is constantly either sixth, seventh, or eighth. Constantly. I love what Komatsu's done at Haas. Well, apparently, so did Toyota because they in, in, literally affiliated not in 2025. Toyota Gazoo Racing affiliated with them with immediate effect. And their livery is now on the Haas car. Immediately. They are now their technical partner. Now. They didn't want to wait. Because let me tell you something. Komatsu has turned that team around. And, you know, the, the, why has he done it? Because he's focused on performance and not marketing. You don't mm -hmm. see him on TV. You know, you don't see him like as, as, as should should night would talk about Puffy, you know, up in the video. Right, up in the club. Yeah. Yeah. He's focusing on performance. And you know what? Performance brings you sponsors. Results, mm -hmm. points bring you sponsors because sponsors see that your car is going to be featured on TV. And that means their logos are going to be featured on TV. Their trademarks are going to be featured on TV. And that's what Mr. Kamatsu has done uh and so does that mean hulkenberg is probably having a little buyer's remorse and he probably should have stayed at haas instead of going I, to sauber well look it's a two-edged sword um sauber is going to be a disaster class next year you know they have announced that they are not changing their chassis next year so okay. they, they are pulling a haas of 2021 haas of 2021 to get ready the regulations of 2022 the last big regulation change mm -hmm. they changed their chassis in 2021 and they were dead last you know p19 p20 every race that is going to be the fate that poor nico um you know and uh, whoever they pick uh alongside him is going to face in, in in 2025 but then audi comes along riding to the rescue and as we all know every time audi has ventured into a new motorsport series, it never fails, and it invariably at some point, a few years down the road, takes the championship. So what Nico has decided, Nico Hulkenberg is a very smart guy. Yes. <laughs> very experienced guy, and he's a very good racer. Um, and he, he is giving away, he is sacrificing what will be a really good year at Haas in 2025 for, I think, a much higher ceiling at Audi post-2026. Um, that's what he's done. German driver, German team, probably a big salary increase and a much higher ceiling. And he's looking probably at three to four years more in F1 uh, if he can last that long, if his performance doesn't drop. Um, but Nico has done a brilliant job driving. He got P8 in the sprint race and... Uh, in the main race in the GP, and now Haas has scored in, I believe, the last four races, last four GPs, which hasn't happened uh, since they were something like P5 or P6. They were like P5 and Constructors um, the last, you know, when they were P5 and Constructors many years ago. So they've been great, uh, exciting to watch. Uh, more people, I can tell you, were sort of cloistered around um, their garage during the pit walks that I'm used to seeing. Usually it's no man's oh, land, like yeah. Sepper is this year. Nobody cares what they're doing. It's sad. No one really cares what they're doing in their in their garage during the pit walks. Uh, now, you know, people care what's going on at Haas. Did they have any good merch? Did they have any Toyota merch? I didn't see that. I mean, Haas today has never spent a lot of money on merch, but I think we're going to see more of that. That's my they're missing out on a lot because look, I, I mean, we got our Ferrari gear on the merch, the, the sweatshirts, the t-shirts, the hats. They they bring in a lot of money considering how much they cost at the race. And Williams, that, that question. I mean, I've spoken to the ownership at Williams, the, the mm -hmm. chairman. They believe very much in merch because they don't have another product. They're not a 
product manufacturer or car manufacturer. This is their product. This raises the money. Haas hopefully will think about that at some point. Well, that's a good segue. Well, we can talk about the guy who doesn't have a seat for next year. Oh. And it's a damn tragedy. And he I'm pretty sure somebody's going to give this guy a seat. Franco Colin Pinto again made Alex Albon. Uh, maybe Alex wasn't as good as we thought, or he's good, but Franco's a lot better. Well, it's funny you should say that. I we just posted something, an experience at Don XO, where I caught Franco at the end of the driver's parade, literally bashing into Alex with his head by accident. By accident. <laughs> but it is, and basically it is a parable or it's, it is symbolic of what he's doing to Alex's career. He is making Alex look bad. And I, I, by the way, I love Alex Albon. He's a great guy. He's a gentleman. He's a good driver, but he's making him look mediocre. I mean, this kid has never been to Coda, has never raced at Coda, never competed at Coda, has one practice at Coda, not even a full weekend, a sprint weekend. Mm. And by the time of the GP, he's stomping Alex Albon. He's just he's, he's beating him left, right, and center, getting into the points. You know, the, the oh, what? what the best seat in Formula if, One, if, please. If, if Franco can do this to Alex, what is Carlos Sainz going to do to him? Uh, I don't know. I, I will tell you this. I told... Franco, when he left the track and in the paddock, you're making a really strong case for yourself for F F1 permanent seat. Are you really, it would be an injustice if you didn't. And I told that to the woman who manages him, who said, smiled at me and said, it's a work in progress. Yeah, I mean, the work in progress, I hear the rumor is, here comes the rumor, Mel. The rumor is, is that he is going to get the V-carp seat and whoever wins between this Yuki and Liam Lawson battle and goes to the Red Bull, he will, they'll go out and get Colin Pinto and put him against, you know, the loser of that, either be Lawson or Yuki. But considering, and I love Yuki, we all know I love Yuki, but considering how he looked at Coda with that spin, and they did put him on the wrong strategy. I don't know why they started him on the mediums when everybody in the top 10 was on hards. And then they put him out there <clears throat> too long and then when he came out and put the hards on he was in traffic and he was in the drs train and then he was asking well how 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 is he ahead of me now i was running in the points and now i'm i'm back here in 15th and he's running almost near the point how, how'd that happen how'd that happen on the when when you're watching it on the track how did that happen <clears throat> i don't know because i was to tell you that I, w I will be frank. I was pretty much watching the Ferrari <laughs> race and the race up front, uh, and a little bit of a little bit of uh, Palo Pinto. But um, I don't know, you know. But Liam is Liam's doing pretty good. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's only one race, but you know, Yuki yeah. did well in the sprint race and. Yeah. He did well in qualifying, and once again, the R and B strategy is not the greatest. I don't think that's a no. strong suit this oh, year. Yeah. You can see it; they make a lot of like, kind of, I don't know. They're making these chances like if they were a twelfth place team or eleventh place team, so they try something. But they're a point scoring team, and now Haas has moved up, and oh, yeah. you know. Awesome. It's now they overtook them. Yeah. Right, Haas is on uh, thirty-eight points, and uh, V Carb is on thirty-six points. Who ever thought that was going to happen? No, nobody thought that. And and for the rest of the season, I think Haas is going to. I mean, I know Hulkenberg is going to continue, and Magnuson really looked racy this weekend. And yeah. I think that Haas has improved, and it probably is a little bit better than the V Carb. At least the drivers are better than the V Carb drivers. And it's going to be an interesting battle to see who finishes ahead. And even the Alpine with Gasly was racy for a while because he was running like seventh for a long while in this race. Yeah, I mean, Pierre had a very strong weekend. His team not so much. He had a slow pit stop. I remember watching a pit stop that looked pretty slow. 
Um, the car is lousy. But at one point, I remember when he was in in, uh, in one of the qualifying sessions, he was like P3 or something like that, which was ridiculous. Mm. I mean, you know, problem is someone like Gasly, you know, never really, you know, obviously didn't prove it at Red Bull, but he'll probably never have the chance again to be in a top car and see what yeah, it's, it's unfortunate but, there's so many of these guys that won't really get the chance to be in the top car, but there's a reason why. And, yeah. you know, the data is there and everybody gets to look at the data, you know, and when you look at the data and you compare and contrast, you're like, well, this guy's not as good as this guy. And I'm going to take the guy that has the potential compared to the guy that's kind of medi- mid, you know, not, not I'm going to say mediocre, but middle of the pack. So you always want to take your chance on the guy who could be the next world champion. Which, which as, far I, as, goes, as I think about it, I mean, he started at the back with the 60 penalty, you know, with like 60. <laughs> yes. Place for a drop. Yeah. And whatever Yuki's strategy was, you know what? It doesn't, whatever Yuki's strategy was, Yuki wasn't running Liam's race. Liam blew all the way through the grid to finish um, in P9. You know what? That's an incredible achievement on a track that he's never raced. Uh, I don't think he he didn't. Liam Lawson, did he score a point? I don't think so. Yeah. He finished in P9. Did he? he finished P9 in the GP. Now, yep. what was going on with yeah. him and our oh, guy? Oh, no, our guy, Fernando oh. Alonso. They had words on the sprint race, and apparently Fernando was telling him, as you can see from this picture right here, that I guess you're not leaving. You got to leave. Hey, Liam, you got to leave a space. Well, and he, he also said he was going to get him. He did uh, say that. But Frank, but you know, uh, Liam ended up overtaking and beating Fernando. And despite whatever Fernando said in a moment of anger, he didn't try to punt young Liam off. The- yeah, the Aston's not looking too great anymore for some reason, but I don't know what it is. It's not looking too great anymore. It's never looked great. Look, I love Aston Martin. I love the people on the team. I've been a frequent Pata Club guest of theirs. Uh, they have lovely people on the team. Their car development has been horrific. Like I said, they started off last, you know, they, they started off 2023 amazing when Dan Fallows came over and they. They have only gone downhill since that debut. Um, every single upgrade just doesn't seem to work. And yeah. we got it, coming up next week. And w- w- what I love about this part is we got three races in a row. We got United States, we got Mexico, and then we have Brazil, which is one of my favorite races, Brazil, because there's oh, all it's great, great right? that Brazil. But Mexico really is a mid race. It's not there's, that not, much, there's not much passing. Yeah, there's not much passing there, but it's reported that is this going to be the race that Checo announces his retirement? I think so. I mean, I love, I have to tell you, as a human being, Checo is one of the nicest people in the paddock. I've met him on many, many occasions. He is a lovely human being. Uh, he is a nice guy. Some, you know, some of the drivers are just so-so as people. He is a prince of a guy. He always has time for people. But the performance is not there. He was P7 uh, at this race. And, you know, Maxi is, you know, Max Verstappen is fighting. It, it just doesn't have a teammate anymore. He's really fighting a one-front war against two cars. And I agree with Christian. The other top teams are hunting with two cars. Ferrari's got uh, Charles and Carlos, and they'll have Lewis next year. Mercedes has, uh, you know, Lewis and uh, George. Uh, McLaren's got Oscar and Lando who finished P4, uh, P, you know, who finished P, P4, P5, Lando and Oscar. And Red Bull has a driver who's here performance-wise and a driver who's here performance-wise. Basically, top driver and someone who's performing as a midfielder. Yeah, Yuki, Yuki uh, out, out-qualified him again. Yeah. He didn't out-finish him, but he out-qualified him. Correct. Yeah. Um, look, something has to give. Red Bull is about performance, and historically, it's been about performance. And it's an, I believe, you know, it's an untenable situation for a top team to be in to have a driver who is underperforming as badly as Checo is. And well, it's not as, I love Checo. As we finish up here, give me your predictions for Mexico. Give me your podium. 
Ferrari 1 2. <laughs> I think it is going to be a good track for them. You think it's going to be a good track for Ferrari? I think it's going to be a good track for Ferrari. Um, so Ferrari it's a street on. track. So we're we looking for Carlos Sainz or we're going to look for Charles Leclerc. Il predestinato. I think uh, Charles is going to is going to is going to win Mexico. I think uh, I, I think we still have a constructors battle on. We've got Red Bull forty points down of yeah. McLaren. They're out of it. I think though. Yeah, Red Bull's out. So only forty. Eight points now south of McLaren. One more one-two and one more subpar race for McLaren, just like U.S. Grand Prix, and it's on like Donkey Kong, baby. That'd be great. I, I, I mean, that's what it's all about. I'd love to see Ferrari come from the back when no one's really talking about them, and they were kind of silently point, get scoring points, scoring points, and then all of a sudden, with five races left, they overtake – at the last race, could happen. That would be great. At the last race, it's on. I think and it's Carlos, Carlos, and Max. Well, thanks once again, Scott, for joining us, and we want to wish Paul um, a speedy recovery because he's been a little under the weather. Yes, I miss him. And everybody. Thank you for tuning in once again for America F1. And we're hope to see you next week as we do a countdown to the Mexican Grand Prix. And I don't know, maybe we'll even do a Mexican Grand Prix pre show if there's some news. Oh, there'll be this news. Week. If there's news this week, we're going to do a show this week. There's going to be news. Well, thanks again. And with all that, as always, Keep on racing, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? I've just been handed an urgent and horrifying news story. And I need all of you to stop what you're doing. All right. Yeah, America F1. America F1. It's a golden run. America F1. Ba -ba 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 -ba.